Wherever you grew up in the world of the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, chances are you had a regular view of things you just passed by fooling around in the bag of one of these. Welcome everyone to a family-friendly 45th episode of the Automotive History series where we are going to take a look at the history of the family truckster, the companion of the suburbs, the squire of the town and country, the station wagon. Let's start with the encyclopedic stuff. For the initiated, the station wagon is a body style that distinguishes itself by offering more cargo space or passenger seating in the rear. It is essentially a regular sedan with a trunk raised to roof level. Add a couple windows and voila, you have a station wagon. But where did station wagons originate? Station wagons are as old as the regular sedan, but the name was applied to a different type of car than that we know today. I feel like a broken record for saying it once again, but just as the horse and cart was replaced by the horseless carriage and later on the car, so the station wagon also replaced a type of vehicle. And that is the depot hack, or hackney. In the late 1800s, railroads were getting common all over the world, and the immediate area around train stations became attractive locations for businesses like hotels, country clubs, spas, resorts and restaurants. These resorts often offered a service where they would pick up guests and the luggage at the train stations in depot hacks. Around the start of the 1900s, the horse was replaced by an engine, and the depot hacks evolved to become motorized versions of the same concept, but the term depot hack was also dropped in favor of station wagons, a motorized wagon that ferry guests from the train station to their hotel. What an eye-opener. These early station wagons were often nothing more than a regular car, let's say a Ford Model T, with only the front bench seat and a chassis. The car was then sent to a custom coach builder who'd build a wooden frame on the back of the car, including row seating and a solid roof, unrollable cloth sidewalls to keep the guests dry. And that is your station wagon, a purely commercial vehicle with not much magic about it. But let's have a look at some other terms people apply to the body style. American English prefers the term station wagon because they take guests from the station to the country estate. In British English, the cars are often referred to as estate cars because they are named after the drop-off point instead of the pickup point, in this case the country estate instead of the station. In Australian English, they don't even know where the wagon is going, so they just keep it at wagon. And in French, the car is often known as a brake, because French station wagons break down all the time, but either that or it's named after a type of carriage also named the brake. Not to mention the shooting brake, but I'll get to that later in the video. And in German, the station wagon is known as Kombi, with a capital K, an abbreviation of Kombination Kraftwagen, or Combination Motor Vehicle. All very interesting. Let's move on, because in the first 30 years of the 20th century, the station wagon was a commercial vehicle with nothing special about it. This started to change in the 1920s. Regular passenger cars roughly came in only two shapes. The sedan, without a trunk or rear-mounted trunk, or the business coupe, which did have a pronounced trunk. But the station wagon, as we know it today, didn't exist. This was until some car makers started to realize that the versatility and practicality of the wagons wouldn't only be interesting for commercial use, but also for personal use. A gradual change started to emerge where car companies not only started to sell station wagons to the public, they also started to produce them entirely in-house. Before that, car makers only offered the bare chassis, third-party custom coach builders did the rest. By the mid-1930s, various car makers built their own wooden station wagons entirely in-house. Interestingly is that the station wagons were, because of the use of wood, among the most expensive models in the lineup of a car maker. And even after the purchase, owners had a higher level of maintenance cost as opposed to owners of regular sedans. The wood required a lot of maintenance, finishing, attention, and some soft, soft caressing, and whispering, and whispering and whispering. And while it would cost a car maker a bit more to create a station wagon, why not throw in some extra luxury features to make up for the price? The image of the station wagons were quickly changed from purely commercial to a luxurious lifestyle vehicle outside of the big cities and into the countryside. And here lies a great opportunity according to Chrysler at the start of the 1940s. Chrysler released the town and country, not a full-on station wagon but more like a wood-clad sedan. That, according to Chrysler, was a luxurious vehicle that would look distinguished both on the muddy country roads in the weekends and on the grand boulevards and city streets on weekdays. So 
something like a crossover? Anyway, a second world war came around and despite all the malaise, it also brought some advancements and technological upgrades for the car industry. After the second world war, the station wagon was once again subject to change. There was a little breakthrough in the construction of wagons, it no longer required to be constructed out of wood. Instead, all steel station wagons started to make the debut, and the first one was the 1949 Plymouth Suburban. Before that, some other car makers already made all steel station wagons, like the 1930 Chevrolet Suburban and the post war Willys Jeep, but these are usually seen as strictly commercial vehicles and not wagons for personal use. The all steel station wagon arrived right on time and rose in popularity because of a series of fortunate events. Number one, the baby boom had started and people sought ways to carry all their kids and stuff around in one car. And number two, because of the all steel station wagons were easier to build, they also dropped in price and became more attainable for the general public. And so the image of the wagon changed once again, from luxurious lifestyle vehicle to the affordable cornerstone of suburban life. In the US, the market share of station wagons rose from just 2% in the 1940s to 17% by the late 1950s. All steel station wagons were all the rage. The last wagon to feature some genuine wood was the 1953 Buick Roadmaster Estate. But don't worry, car makers had a worthy replacement of the real deal. And this was 100% genuine, authentic, artesian, wood appliqué. Or simulated wood grain if you will. And just because wagons dropped in price doesn't mean that they were not luxurious. In fact, for a short while, Chevrolet experimented with the so-called sports wagon. Wagons that only came in two doors, and although they looked nice, they were also the most expensive models in Chevy's lineup after the Corvette sports car, but people generally didn't seem to care. Up until the early 60s, the station wagon was pretty much an American affair. But after 10 years of rebuilding, Europe started to catch on with their own baby boom. And that spawned a wide variety of European station wagons. Uh, estate cars. Wagons quickly became a popular choice for Europeans because of the value for money. Fuel was always expensive, and if you could buy a car that came in two versions, a regular sedan or a station wagon that practically had the same fuel consumption, then why wouldn't you choose for the latter if you get more storage space in return? The wagons also helped greatly carrying around kits and stuff during the European post-war baby boom years. And during these years, an interesting subseries of European wagons emerged. The shooting brake. The shooting brake is exactly what the name implies. It's a brake, a type of carriage used for shooting. And no, I'm not talking about a cannon. In the late 1800s, the cart would carry around guns, hunting spoils and ammunition on shooting trips. Up until the Second World War, the shooting brake remained an entirely English affair. The cart evolved to become a vehicle, still suitable for shooting trips, but also hauling participants from the train station to the estate. There it is again, where the shooting session took place. The story goes that in the mid-60s, English industrialist Sir David Brown wanted to own a stylish car where he could put his hunting dog and guns in, but found his current car, an Aston Martin DB5, unfit. So he had to convert it into a sporty looking wagon, stretching the car and adding an extra compartment in the rear. And a contemporary edition of the shooting brake concept was born. More limited edition runs followed, also made by various other luxury car makers, and were often elongated Grand Tourers. Around the start of the 70s, some mainstream car brands started to offer shooting brake-like vehicles as well, but weren't really sold as such, like the Volvo 1800 ES and the Reliance Scimitar GTE. These companies like to call them sports estates. The ultimate high point of station wagons at least in the US, was at the start of the 70s. Wagons were usually based on the full-size regular sedan counterparts, and since those grew year after year, so did the station wagons, usually with even more length for added interior space. By the mid-70s, American wagons were truly massive suburban battle tanks that were just under 6 meters in length or almost 20 feet, and were full of the latest gimmicks, like a two-way tailgate. It will either open like that, or if you prefer, like so. Or even better, a clamshell tailgate, various third row seating arrangements and interesting glass roof designs. And all this was sold to you under fantastical model names. Ford had a Squire, 
from where you head out into the country, Oldsmobile offered a cruiser that showed you around all the great vistas, and Chrysler offered you a wagon that looked good in town and out in the country. Just when you think these cars couldn't get any larger and more opulent, it was a worldwide event that would change things forever. And I'll give you three seconds to guess what it is. Let's see, we're 45 episodes in right now, so you can probably guess it. Right, the oil crisis of 73. The rise in fuel prices, new regulations regarding safety and emissions put an end to the humongous American wagons. Their engines were detuned to meet regulations and lost power. And because wagons were already so heavy, they became rather slow. The answer of the industry was to eventually downsize regular sedan models and their wagon versions, but it also limited their interior space and thus practicality. Some of the people that used to buy wagons started to lose interest and shifted to other vehicle body styles like personalized cargo vans, which experienced a short-lived craze in the later 70s. And yes, I made a video about it. Others were so adventurous to buy this thing called an SUV, which is kind of like a raised station wagon. I don't know, I think this fad will pass quickly. But the real blow came in at the start of the 1980s. The wagons were increasingly seen as dull and uninspiring sluggish cars, and on top of that gained competition from an entirely new type of car, the minivan. Chrysler in the US and Renault in Europe were the first to release the minivan, a, and I'm not kidding, stylish and young and hip kind of personal van, one that makes you instantly forget about those dreary wagons, with their fake wood panels still trying to look like they belong in the 40s. And those minivans came just in time. Those who were born during the baby boom era, so the late 40s and the 50s, now were young and hip adults, starting their own families. And they didn't want it to be seen in the dull cars their parents drove, the station wagons. The wagon was getting ridiculed, and a famous example is the Wagon Queen family truckster in the movie National Lampoon, which came out in 1983, right when the minivan was about to take over the world. The Wagon Queen family truckster. You think you hate it now, but wait till you drive it. And from here on out, the wagon was digging its own grave in the US. More and more car makers dropped the wagon version in the 80s, and when the 90s came around, wagons gained another competitor the sports utility vehicle, the SUV, essentially a station wagon on steroids. Often touted as the last great full-size station wagon, the Buick Roadmaster Estate from the mid-90s was the last of the breed that started after the Second World War, complete with, of course, wood paneling. After that, Americans could still buy station wagons in various sizes, but more and more American car makers discontinued all their wagon models in favor of the SUV. I believe one of the last American wagons is the Buick Regal Tour X, marketed as some sort of active lifestyle vehicle, instead of a family hauler. But it's nothing more than a rebadged Opel or Vauxhall, oh, sorry, Vauxhall insignia. In Europe, however, the station wagon remains popular, and plenty of car makers offer various wagon models in all shapes and sizes, from an economical Renault Megane station wagon to an Audi RS6 Avant powerhouse, the choice is diverse. Wagon sales can account as for much as a quarter to a third of the total car sales in that particular European country. One reason I can think of is that the full-size SUV is still too costly for many average Europeans to own, although European makers have found a solution. The crossover. It's like a station wagon that spent the night with an SUV, but at a more manageable price and size. Today I don't see the wagon disappear all that quickly in Europe, but what happened in the USA back in the 90s with the SUV craze, the wagon also has to hold itself up in an increasingly competitive market, with the ever-rising popularity of crossovers and small SUVs. And sometimes the lines are getting blurry. Take a station wagon, raise the roof and it becomes a minivan or a monospace. Lift it, and it becomes an SUV. Lower the roof again, and it becomes a crossover. Lower and shorten it, and it's a hatchback. All very confusing, and the differences are sometimes minimal. I sometimes see a car that has the exact same dimensions as a station wagon, but subtly is sold as a crossover, or even worse, a coupe SUV. But that's a story for another time. I'm going to head out now and do some Vista cruising.